Hi, everybody, and welcome to Module 3 of Inclusion of Students with Special Needs. So I'm looking right now, and I can see I have the badgers in the back, and it's tilted a little bit, but it is level, and this monitor looks level, so I'm not sure what's going on here. It's defining logic. It's one of those places you visit where if you drop a ball, it rolls uphill, or if you throw water up, it goes up like if you throw it over the Hoover Dam. I don't know what's going on, but uh, the rest of the laws of physics seem to be applying at this moment. So we're going to go ahead with the Module 3 Fireside Chat. The fireplace is over there. I decided to just do it this way today. Um, it does cut together a little easier this way. And I'm trying to use some different software um, that runs that banner across the bottom saying, this is education. 506, 306, 305, I don't know. It's the combo, special combo. It's the meta class, 306, 506. Um, but anyway, um, here's what we're going to do today. I do have a shout out for the progression of inclusion assignment that was due at the end of module two, so due a week ago. And I have a shout out for everybody. I took um, notes as I went through, and I have something to share about everybody's um, inclusion project. So thank you very much. And um, we're going to talk somewhat about module three that we're in now, a little bit about four, a little bit about five to kind of look at so you can see how these pieces fit together. I am going to um, update the grade book over the weekend so then all of your grades from modules one and two will be will be posted. So um, first off, please continue to be active posters. It is uh, imperative in a class like this that that we have a high level of posting so i appreciate what you've what you've put into the class and you know, let's keep it going uh during our next you know basically well about a month and a half so um we are dun, 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 going to start off with a story that i referenced a couple times in some different posts i wanted to share a story about inclusion and a teenage um, girl. So here is the story, but first of all, it is allergy season, and it seems that none of the medications that I take over the counter help me, so I resort to my good friend, this monster drink. And so I don't know, something in these things and the, the caffeine, whatever it is, seems to, seems to calm the vocal cords a little bit. I'm not even sure what flavor that is. I don't think I could describe that. So, um, anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna say the girl's name is Charlotte, for the sake of the story. Imagine Charlotte as maybe eighth grade or freshman, but she's having a birthday party. So typical birthday party for some a girl that age. And um, I'm gonna try something here with the camera. How about we try? You're like, Dave, come on, buddy. Stop experimenting. This is getting wild. All right. I like that a little better. Okay. Nope, that will not be edited out. So, um, but, so, Charlotte is having a birthday party, and she has uh, friends, um, and, you know, is, is doing well at school. And what happens is, before her birthday party, like a week before, um, her dad gets a visit from two of her friends. So how I know this is I'm at a conference and her dad is presenting his story, which I'm telling to you right now. And his story is really about the awareness of the social aspects of inclusion of children, children with disabilities. So doorbell rings, he answers it, and his daughters, you know, two of her friends are there and, and uh, they ask, can we, can we sit down with you and your wife and, and talk about Charlotte? So, of course, it's like, I'm sure. I mean, and, you know, they're anticipating the worst. And these, these girls say, um, you know, Charlotte is a young lady now. And you dress her more for your convenience than what her interests and her styles are, which was the first time mom or dad had ever heard that. And they did. They dressed her well. And dad had shown some pictures um, on the, the screen at this time. But, you know, it was, it was more of the nicer running suit type things. Um, and 
you know, things like that that really that really were more of in the way that she wore her hair and, and they didn't paint her fingernails and things like that. It was it was something that was more for convenience. Worked out great when she was younger and they just never changed it because it just kept, you know, working. Which is something that happens in IEPs, by the way, too, is you get to an IEP meeting and you know you're ready to pull some services back because the student is doing really well. You might go for more in, in inclusive time. And people are like, whoa, like if we do that, it might not work. And then if it doesn't work and the student fails or struggles, then it's going to be really bad. So, well, maybe, but why won't it work? I mean, if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll bring the supports back in. Um, but in this case, you know, the parents had just kind of gotten used to dressing Charlotte a certain way. So the, the dad said, of course, you know, he and his wife welcomed the ideas, the suggestions. And anyway, um, they had a party before the party. So her friends came over and they did up Charlotte's nails and they um, totally did her hair and her parents went out and bought some really cool clothes. And back at that time, um, you might remember the Bedazzler. It was a you can buy one on TV and you could basically put rhinestones on jeans and anything like that. So I think her mom um, got a bedazzler and kind of went to town on some clothes because Charlotte liked things like that. She was totally into that. So, um, you know, you can totally imagine this, this, this um, way that they're, I wouldn't say reinventing Charlotte. They're, they're kind of uh, helping Charlotte evolve into who Charlotte is. And one of the things is she loved the Backstreet Boys. So, her wheelchair had, um, you know, like a like a tray that that could attach, and it was it was transparent. So what they did is they took this Backstreet Boys poster and trimmed it down and put it on the underside of her tray, and then took um, transparent uh, tape and put it all the way around. So this poster was this contact paper poster was up. So as you looked at the tray, you'd see the back Backstreet Boys. They did some pretty cool stuff too, like the wheels and things like that. So again, Dad showing pictures of, of this. Um, and she has, and just how excited Charlotte is and, and she's communicating just how, how awesome this makes her feel. And her friends are just saying, it's just, it's really cool because this is something she's showing so much more of, of her interest and really who she is. Um, so the dad, again, in giving this presentation is wrapping this up of saying, you know, we never thought of that side with Charlotte and we're so thankful that her friends knew us well enough and cared enough about Charlotte to bring this up because you know you can imagine being a friend coming in and sharing that type of thing with a parent. Um, that's probably not the easiest to do. Um, but again, dad was extremely appreciative and, and wanted to share this at the conference to encourage people to share the story again, um, you know, for school administrators and for IEP meetings to make sure that you have discussions about, you know, just an awareness of what some of the other peers are doing in, in social group and things like that, because parents um, can lose touch with that, especially if it's an only child or, you know, it's the oldest child that has um, the disability. So anyway, I, I just like that story because I, I remember him with the bedaz showing the bedazzler pictures and they totally got bedazzled with Charlotte. Um, so I want to remind everybody to turn in your assignments on time, which means post them on time. Um, you know, some people did get a couple days beyond the timeline for the progression of inclusion. So um, let's make sure anything going forward. The timeline is always in parentheses at the, in the module. Uh, Whatever is listed then as parentheses, do, da da da, da whatever. Um, so make sure that you're, you're making your responses by then. Um, let us start with module two, dun, 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 dun. progression of inclusion, timelines, shout outs, 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 outs. All right, I'm getting an updated software editing version, um, which should allow me to do some cool stuff like that. You're like, no, please, please don't. Um, Anthony, you uh, mentioned the 1958 congressional uh, funding that came forward for special education teachers. And I'm glad that you put that in your, your presentation because there's, there's often this, this myth that um, special education is highly funded or fully funded, you know, whatever that means. But um, when special ed education services started, and really when they kind of got their 
1975 with the um, Education for All Handicapped Act. But, you know, even around, you know, 1958, what you reference, uh, funding was supposed to be fully per the federal government. And it never was fully, and to this day, it continues to, to dip down. Um, and what we, what we see then is, you know, some people think, well, if, if a student with a disability attends a school, schools hit the jackpot because then you get federal idea flow through dollars and other categorical aid. Well, um, those type of myths can start to create bad feelings between teachers, and it can also create, um, you know, an entitlement sometimes with the parent who might say, well, I'm going to make sure that we get X number of services out of, out of this school. Um, the reality is for categorical aid, even on a really high need student, uh, maybe let's say that a student had a teacher assigned to them the whole time. That teacher only worked with that student, which is very rare to happen, but that maybe half of that teacher's salary infringe at best. And then you might get a little bit of Medicaid reimbursement and then, some federal flow through, which doesn't average out to, you know, typically more than a couple thousand of students. So, you know, let's say, you know, salary and benefits, um, you know, that the, the teacher is 75,000. I mean, maybe, you know, you get 50, 55,000 back, not including cost of transportation things. So well, I guess what I'm trying to put out there is that's a myth. If people say, you know, having students with disabilities, the district is flush with money that no. Um, but what it, it does create then, because that promise was never fulfilled by the government, is it creates this 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 haves and have nots type of environment, um, where you know you, you are obligated to provide services, so you have to prioritize, and maybe it means that there isn't going to be a tech ed um, purchase because that needs to go into a specialized piece of equipment for a child. And again, it's it's an uncomfortable situation that's put together more by the law than I, than I think of anybody in the school and the intentions of school staff um, who are trying to manage finite resources. So again, just wanted to expand upon that. Mark, um, techn technological advances and inclusion, or I'm just going to say technology because it's easier for me to say right now. Um, I, I really enjoyed the photos. And I think I posted that the one photo of the Kurzweil reminded me of the copier in the Movie nine to five, uh, back. Oh, what was it? Had to be early eighties. Um, but where the copy machine goes all crazy and papers all over. But yeah, it's amazing how uh, the big the technology was. I remember a few years ago we went through a technology closet um, when I was the director and and cleaned out a whole bunch of things that really weren't that old, but they were just obsolete and they were big. So uh, your post. Mark, your, your, your presentation reminds me of a, of a friend I had in elementary school. His name was Pete. And it was about, well, it was Halloween years and years and years ago. And we had our village hall in town, which at that time was as old as a school, like 100 years. Um, and they had a, like a haunted house. And Pete had, was, had a hearing loss, pretty significant, but he, he was not deaf. And... We show up to this haunted house at night, and he has a shirt kind of like this, and has a big pocket in front. He has this like huge battery pack in this pocket. I mean, this thing's this thing is like the size of this calculator. Um, it's in his front pocket. It's kind of bulging out. It's like tagged on to the pocket and or clipped on, and, and then this this like cord goes up to to I don't know if it's a unilateral or bilateral hearing aid, but I mean, really pronounced stuff. It was it was more than what he wore at school, and I remember you know Pete being just really self conscious about that. Of course, we're his friends, you know. So Tuss, um, you know, we were that wasn't going to be a barrier between us and Pete. But you know, Pete was very nervous about that, too. and also like going in there and what if I lose like part of it and things like that. I mean, because obviously it's expensive stuff. You know, it's all custom. Um, but I look now, you know, and you look at hearing aids that are you know, so small you can't even identify them, or cochlear implants, which have gotten, you know, just really, really small. Um, and, and two, like hearing aids today, they have taken away some of the stigma by allowing kids, hey, do you want it red, blue, yellow, 
green? Do you want some tie dye effect? Do you want some logo? I mean, all these things, and they, they do it on the mold, um, which I think is really a cool thing. But of course, you know, that's not the way uh, devices used to be. And now, the coolest thing with iPads, I'm glad, you know, you stopped when you did, I think 2012 in your presentation, because between then and now, almost everything has gone iPhone or iPads. So iPhones that can, you know, read QR codes or there's there's apps where you can just take a photo and up, anything that's text and it'll come up and, and read it for you. Um, just think of everything, you know, that you can just, this, my phone has like 32 gig of memory, but I mean, you could easily put 128 gig and record a teacher presenting a lecture. You can have things like that, you know, email back and forth, but it really takes down the barriers of not having what I'm calling inclusive technology. So if you have a phone or iPad or things like that, like everybody does, you don't stand out. It's not like the days of that Kurzweil, which had to be dragged around, you know, on a wagon from room to room with you. So I think we're at this really exciting time in technology for people with disabilities it, because it has now become the same technology that everybody uses for the most part. It, it's become the native technology. It's just designed to have a universal ac access or you can get um, apps or programs or things that go with it, but it's exciting. It really is. It's, it's very exciting. So I appreciate that. Joe, through time or thorough timeline of inclusion for the blind. All right. Um, I have to learn to read what I write here. Uh, you provided new information, um, which I, I appreciate it. I, you know, I was left with a question after reading your, your presentation because I work for Wisconsin School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So the question is, do I work in a, an inclusive setting because everybody has a visual impairment who's a student? Or is that completely an exclusive setting? So I can kind of see both sides of it, but it brings up a real kind of dilemma sometimes. Um, I will say that students that we have at the school uh, because of the, I mean, the vast, vast amount of, of specialized technology and training and resources um, specific to, to braille orientation mobility and sensory and motor that's specific to children with, um, you know, different degrees of visual impairments. It would be very difficult to replicate in a district and to um, replicate a peer group that you could do activities with to that extent. I remember last year in the middle of winter, cold morning going out with the gym, a gym class, which was not very big, probably four or five kids. And we have this huge tractor inner tube. So, um, so Seaver can think about this farm, huge tractor inner tube. And literally like I'm on it, gym teacher, assistant and like four kids and we go down this hill let's go down that then ends up at this track um and back of school and if you go beyond the track then you end up going down the hill and into the river so you know you don't want to go that far but uh yeah i mean it just is awesome and it, it I, I don't know it's hard to explain but on the other hand you know i can i can see where you could say you're not with, um, you know, non-disabled peers. And I don't know. We've never, in my experience there, you know, it's just three, going in three years now, um, I can't remember an IEP meeting where a student has, has wanted to leave the school. I've been at a number of meetings where, um, you know, schools want students to return to be served in the home district, and the student pretty much refuses. And then that gets interesting, but... Um, so anyway, I, I really did appreciate your your presentation, um, and it, it leaves me kind of reassessing how I would answer the question of, you know, is my setting inclusive or not? Brent, found, you, you provide a foundation to progression of inclusion in sports. So I really found your presentation to be fundamental in, in you know, and I know I, I, I hinted, you had a, a slide, I think it was 1908 or something about um, psychology and serving people, you know, with disabilities. And I kind of, you know, in theming it with where you were going at, I kind of looked at that as maybe early sports psychology, maybe not. Um, but you, you really, um, you, you really did a, 
nice job laying down again that, that fundamental framework and then i could i could see where you know when you stopped where the other parts would start to come into your present your presentation you know you could add special olympics you could add um decisions such as I, I forget who it was you know that was allowed to use a golf cart in the P professional golf association um because they had a a mobility disability and that had been banned you couldn't you couldn't use that in the past. But I watched a presentation on a science channel and it was these new carbide, and maybe they're not carbide, but carbide tungsten, whatever it is, but it's a special compound. They're making these um, artificial limbs in the Paralympics. They talked about this after, after Rio and how th the question is starting to come up in that setting. Are we creating bionics that are so advanced that we either have to govern the bion bionics, meaning like, you know, we could have people run faster than anyone's ever run before and then what impact does this have on the whole body because you know the body wasn't probably engineered to be you know running 30 35 miles an hour um but also you know are we are we kind of creating the super athlete in some aspects and they're really getting at a crossroads where they they have to make some decisions on how they treat some of these pieces of equipment that you know, we were thrilled that they were giving people an opportunity to participate in sports and have access. And now it's creating this situation where, if, okay, now you have access. Now you actually have, you know, your um, specialized equipment, which is giving you the superhuman ability in some aspects. Um, so just really fascinating because it is one thing that we're going to see, you know, probably quite common just because technology is going to advance uh, for a number of um, in the Paralympics I think we're gonna we're going to see some kind of governing measure put on that you can you know this is what you can have just like they do in NASCAR and, and things like that I mean you can't have a car that goes 350 miles an hour around the track uh, for the safety of, of just the sport but um, so intro things Seaver Make sure I tell your mom I gave you the big Seaver shot out there. So you introduced um, introduced names, common and uncommon, in your presentation about um, successful people with this disabilities. And you went on to identify and kind of bracket, define out what you meant by um, successful, which is subjective. I get that. And it's hard to understand what that means. But you, I really like that you brought in John Nash because like most people don't do that. I mean, FDR it is super important, very relevant, but people kind of stay more on that, that theme. And you did a nice job weaving together more about the, the names that everyone would recognize and the names that are less familiar, but very relevant. Um, so one of the things I, you know, I'm thinking through this and, and I'll, again, you know, I know, I've read that Dan Aykroyd has autism, and he wrote himself about how autism helps him, you know, to be an actor, but also the struggles in movies like Ghostbusters and, um, you know, other, it's, it's it, I never knew that, but yeah, yeah. So, um, here's what I look at when I identify what is successful. I define success as identifying a goal, um, planning for how to meet that goal, three is growth toward that goal, or attainment of that goal and what happens is people are getting so focused on achievement only did you hit the goal or not well you know you lose out on on celebrating growth and recognizing growth from baseline if you only look at attainment so you know i i think those components of of even goal setting and how to plan for a goal and just you take a, a step toward achieving that goal even if it doesn't really move you much from baseline, it does because you've taken a step toward doing that. So that's where I, I see success. And the further you can grow and if you can attain, those are, you know, some different measures you could use for success. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely think goal planning, you know, for me, comes into that. And, again, I appreciate it, your presentation and the, the different names that you chose. Um, so, Daniel. The Abdenberg 1840s, going to kind of stick with me. Again, that was new to me and, and significant. You know, I did some additional research on that. With the, the intent of that in Switzerland was to 
cure cretins or, you know, people that, um, the, the intent was to normalize people to society, people with intellectual disabilities. Well, what you know, you did the paper, I mean, presentation, right? Um, but this whole thing of where we, we identified what was normal and then what wasn't normal, and then the attempt was to normalize. And I think that resembles, for me, this core of, the, you know, we always hear close the, close the gap, close the gap, close the gap for achievement. And what I hear in that is, you know, we have to normalize, normalize, normalize. And I don't like the way that that's ever put out those things of, you know, like we have this achievement gap between students with disabilities and students without disabilities. Well, part of that because they are students with disabilities. I mean, um, and of course we want to maximize, but to say like, if you don't hit this level, um, you know, then, then we're going to ignore, we're not looking at growth, we're looking, did you attain or not? Um, so I, I don't know. I, it's really, I, I think we've moved beyond in so many ways not to try to normalize. And if anything, society's gone toward being more celebrating individuals and individualization. Believe it or not, this is true. Bought a pair of glasses last week. Usually where I'm going to, I don't know when I do these, but, um, have a skull on each side. Skull. Yeah. So, and... 44, going to be 45 in like five weeks. So first pair of skull glasses I've ever had. But, you know, they're kind of fun. Um, and they're not, I mean, they're, they're there. Otherwise, you can see them if you look from the front. But, um, but you know, kind of like the story I shared before with, with Charlotte, I, I think this move to normalize to some extent, society has, has kind of bucked that trend and is celebrating um, people, you know, kind of, showing off their own uniqueness and celebrating that. So, all right, at least that's what I think. But um, but thank you for, for mentioning um, the Avonberg, uh, you know, situation. And I'm going to look into that more and, and probably incorporate that into a future class. Ben Sputnik, yes, I think part of it landed in Wisconsin, right? I'm not kidding on that. I think part actually did like a mammoth walk or something. Um, you, I like how you, you framed the world view of the U.S. You know, like in your presentation, how when Russia appeared to be leading in the space race, it was kind of like, you know, raising waters float all boats. It was an effort by the government to increase um, educational opportunities and educational levels for all students with disabilities and without. And it kind of took that big event to have it happen. And I think where we're at right now is kind of misdriven to some extent because we hear so much on the news that the U.S. is behind, you know, these 17 other countries in science and these 24 in math and whatever. Well, you know, that does, you can't do that because the testing isn't equitable between uh, countries on, you know, what students you test, how many students at what age, and things like that. That's never equal. So I, I don't like when those come out. I listened to a national presenter who had worked in the Chinese government, higher level, and the, I was at, at this conference, and, and this guy was brilliant, had worked in their economics and things like that. And he gave a presentation which said, you know, well, we hear, for example, of, of China, and, and you have this video of of me interviewing um, Greg and his visit to China, which was a few years ago, but still very relevant. Um, but what you don't hear is that the United States continues to lead the world in intellectual patents every year. And not only lead, like continue to widen the gap, like the U.S., is expanding its its prominence in intellectual patents over the rest of the world. And just patents in general, the U.S. continues to dominate and is just getting stronger every year at this. But you don't hear about that at all when you talk about, you know, the U.S. isn't comparable to whoever in testing and things like that. So, you know, it's very selective information that's, that is looked at. But I think, um, you know, with... The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and schools, uh, public schools having um, educate, you know, the, uh, you know, being given um, the purpose of educating all students. I think I think the U.S. is doing a good job. 
And you could always, you know, any any school, any country, I mean, so these countries can can say, you know, what things we'd like to do better or change or whatever. And some of that's tied to resources. And another part is, you know, initiatives just change with elections. So you don't have enough time to, to have something grow roots. But, um, but yeah, Ben, I, I appreciate, you know, the reference of how schools were very responsive, um, you know, during the perception that other countries were getting ahead of. And also now how, you know, some of the information actually I think was kind of kept from us to give us this, this impression, uh, you know, that we're vastly underperforming. One of the things a friend of mine told me that had been an administrator in China. So Greg doesn't mention this in his video, but my friend who was an administrator in China lived there for a year with his family. And he said students would, um, I, all he knew was homework. So this is like elementary kids would work. Uh, he remembers a few things to, to point out just how, um, you know, how much stress this put on kids. That a kid, a, a girl took a test, got one wrong, and sat at her desk and cried for the rest of the day. Just cried because she knew when she got home, you know, that she was going to have to practice instead of, you know, until 10 o'clock at night, maybe 1130, um, perpetually. And at recess, they would have recess, and he said, the kids didn't know how to play. So you'd ring, the, the bell would ring, and, you know, you kind of shuffle the kids out in the hallway and they'd try to get them outside, but they would stand. They didn't know what to do. And when you taught them games, they, it was really a foreign concept to them. And, uh, and he said it was just very, very awkward, very awkward. So, Brenda, uh, one of your slides, again, you know, there are some words that stick with me, threat of the feeble-minded. And, and eugenics, you know, getting into this, this where we understand, we expect there's a, a normalcy and that we can identify people that are not normal. And then um, and what you pointed out is, is the perception years ago of then, you know, people being a threat to society, possibly, um, because they, they didn't understand the laws or that they were going to consume resources, other things. Um, and yeah, eugenics was was really strong, um, you know, in different parts of the world, well into the '60s, and even in the U.S. to some extent, you know, some eugenics type experiments. Um, so it's it's really a horrible, dangerous um, road to go down, and it's one of those things we ought to be vigilant with because with science advancing, um, you know, science is going to give us more controls over people than we've had before you know so you also think let's say a student with an intellectual disability um, so is there an argument to be made well this student is a runner and if we implant that student with a RFID or some kind of GPS device then we can identify where they're at at all times for their safety and make those type of arguments um, I don't know. I, I, I think, again, we're going to have some really fine ethics lines to walk as we move forward with how we interface technology with, um, with people with disabilities. So we make sure that we're using it as a benefit to them and not as a way to control them. Um, Caitlin, you talked about um, early um, legislation it, all of all of the different court cases. I mean, the many many court cases that led up to the 1975 Education for All Handicap Act. And w the point that you made, and I don't know if, if you recognize that you made it or not, but hold on just a second. That is good stuff. Again, I have no idea what that flavor is. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a bad rhubarb. Um. The reality is anytime a bill gets passed, it has to do with education or probably anything, but I mean, my experience is with education, the, how the, what the bill really means is finally, finally defined by the courts through numerous court cases. And I remember IDEA, the version that we have now, actually, well, which isn't, I don't know if it's still IDEA or educating every, every student succeeds or whatever it is, but, um, so it was a Wisconsin school district that defined a piece of that 
the parent had wanted the district to continually change the services for a child. So the district would try something for a week or two. The parents say, it's not working. It's not working. We need to have an IP. We're going to change it. And the district finally argued, hey, like we need time to allow this to work. And they went to due process, the, the district and the parent. And the courts ruled that, yeah, the district did have the right to give it time, which I think they said in the, I mean, they didn't give like a number of like that everyone else would go off of. But I think it was roughly, they said, you know, about a quarter to have something work that they implemented for a child for whatever it was that they were doing. And I know that case is one that I referenced a few times when I was a director because we do get in a situation too with um, especially students, especially needs where you get creative and people feel if it doesn't work right away, it's not going to work. Well, you don't know that. I mean, it takes, it takes a while. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Um, your presentation, your presentation and, you know, really putting the backstory out there of all the bills that come into kind of like the hallmark bill. I mean, in all the legal cases that, that kind of, to duke it out. So module three, um, inclusion in the other kids is what we're going to talk about and some strategies on how to uh, promote that. Um, it is something that I think people, uh, you know, definitely who's going to say I'm not, you know, for inclusion or overtly say that, but it is something that needs a, a base um, of, of a fundamental base of, you know, why we believe in inclusion. Now, I'm going to give an example. A district I worked with when I was, when I was with CESA had a very inclusive high school uh, up until the point where the honor roll was released before graduation. And then with that class ranking, and of the top five students, two were students with disabilities. And suddenly some teachers and parents were questioning, of, well, these students had accommodations and the classes weren't exactly the same as the other classes that some students took. So is it really fair that they be included in class rank? And that district needed to work through that question. And it kind of tore polarized people a little bit, you know, put people into different camps. Uh, but the district was strong enough where they worked through that in a relatively short amount of time and were unified hiccups, excuse me, moving forward. And the position they unified on is, you know, we believe in our IEPs and that they provide rigor. We're not going to go through any type of waiting system for classes. We're not going to try to be exclusive. If you've earned, you know, as these, these two students did, your, your spot on the top five, then you should receive the appropriate scholarship that goes along with that. Um, so, you know, that's kind of big picture stuff for this week. When we talk about Module 4, Module 4 is how to support um, change. And it, it gets into more of, you know, kind of the technicalities of supporting change, how to plan out moving toward inclusion, putting that to a timeline. And then Module 5, so a little bit off, but it's, it's kind of, so now is more theory, I guess is what I'm saying. And kind of you working through your own thoughts and beliefs on this. But when we get into Module 5, Module 5 is, is black and white, universal design for learning. So we talk about co-teaching. We talk about um, station teaching, teach and assist, which often people assume a regular education teacher and a special education teacher teaching together is co-teaching, when really in a lot of settings that is teach and assist because those teachers have not had adequate planning time. It's a regular education teacher leads the lesson. Special education teacher might come in, help some struggling students. Again, that's teach and assist. That's not really co-teaching. If you're going to have co-teaching, authentic co-teaching, which is fundamental to inclusive practices. And then we can talk about things like looping, which I am a big fan of looping. You know, where you're, if I'm in first grade this year, then my entire first grade goes with the teacher into second grade and then maybe into third grade. So, um, I, I, I'm surprised. Year, years ago when I was teaching, um, that was very big and it doesn't seem that big anymore, but it's very inclus inclusion friendly, very inclusion friendly. Um, but yeah, we talk about universal design for learning and common plan time, all kind of the nuts and bolts types of, of, of things then. So we get up to that in module five. So if you're, if you're trying to see where all these pieces together, we're, we got through some 
you know, what I would say is definitions, you know, tolerance, mainstreaming, inclusion, all of those things, acceptance. And, you know, you've done some of your own dating to see your own personal interests, like with the progression of inclusion timeline. And now we're getting into, you know, talking about inclusion and the other kids, you know, which is a, a document I have, which by its title is so ridiculous because there really aren't any other kids. There's just kids. Like, you know, we include all kids. So if if we have a student who's an English language learner, if we have a student who's six foot four and can't sit in a regular desk and needs a table, um, you know, whatever it is. So even the, again, that title I think is is set up that way in, in the one in in the one article or, or the document is, is set up that way to have the irony right in the title. Because again, really there are no other kits. So because there is no such thing as normal that we move toward. And I think I think the bell curve is is a bad way to measure a lot of things. Um, I listened to a an ec uh, economist who was, was trying to dabble in sociology and psychology, did a miserable job arguing how, you know, that's trying to, to pigeonhole people and everything that they would be by how they scored on one IQ test or something. But so anyway, uh, my intent is not to make this longer than it needs to be. I don't know how long it is, 41 minutes, 24 seconds. This is done. I told the bedazzler story. Dun, dun, dun. Um, but please continue, continue to be active posters in this class and feel free again to use different ways to express learning. So if you want to film something like this of yourself, but not 40, one minutes long of answering a question and post it awesome you can embed like a youtube video or something like that you know you don't have to just type things in so again i, I encourage you to to consider doing something like that it'd be it, it'd be really man it'd be really cool again people tend to follow okay i know i've, I've written a paper my entire life i've always been asked to do this i know how to do this i'm gonna do this so um, I have to write a book. I have a multi-book contract, not this book. It's a good book, though. It's called The Unthinkable. Um, but anyway, and uh, it's, I have certain chapters, well, not chapters, but the whole book is due, so i got to get that kind of done. But um, so I'm writing like, I'm writing five books, I'm writing six, I added one in. Um, so it's crazy. It's crazy, but I emphasize inclusion of people and children with disabilities and safety in all of my books. That's a thread you'll see in anything that is out there, and uh, that has my name on it. So, which nothing is out there now because nothing uh, book-wise it's been published. I did write an article and submitted it this week um, on decision making for School Business Affairs magazine. They had asked me to do an article for them for their February lessons learned. At, um, journal and then um, I have another article I did for uh, Sprigio, which is a school safety company in California. So you're like, what? Okay. But I'm just saying, I try to use the filter of inclusion in, in all of my, in all of my work to make sure I'm, I'm writing so people consider inclusion of all people with disabilities, all students. Enough of that. And thank you. Let's have a good module three, be active posters. And I will see you again in Module 4. All right, and well-deserved shout-out to everybody for your progression of inclusion timelines. All right, now right here is where I would hit the Duran Duran, but of course I can't because YouTube would then say matched copyright content and it'd have to take it down. So you'll just have to pick your favorite Duran Duran song. Play it now. Log into class. Makes a post. All right, thank you.